and girls. I'm glad to see you again. I am having a really lonely summer without you guys, but I'm super glad to have you here today. I've got a really good fairy tale, and then I've got a whole bunch of silly animal things. A poem, a song, finger play. I hope you like animals. Do you ever go to the zoo and look at the animals? Or maybe you have lots of books about animals at home. Maybe you've got some dogs or cats as pets. Maybe you've got a pet gorilla. Do you have a pet gorilla? I once knew a person who had a pet gorilla. Or maybe I didn't. Maybe I'm making that up. <laughs> Let's get started, okay? <laughs> Clap your hands if you love stories. Clap your hands, I know you do. I'm so glad that we could be together. Glad to share a story time with you. This is the story of the bronze ring. Once upon a time, there was a king who lived in a faraway land in a palace that was surrounded by gardens. And these were the most beautiful gardens that anyone had ever seen. The gardens produced flowers and fruit. And the king was so happy with them that he showered gifts upon the man who tended to them, the gardener. Well, this gardener had a son. And it happened that the son was the one who was in charge of taking the fruit and the flowers to the castle every day. Now, the son was a very handsome young man and smart and kind. And when he would take the things to the castle, he oftentimes met the princess, the king's daughter. And over time, the two fell in love with each other. Well, it came time that the princess was old enough to be married and the king set his mind to it. And he told her that she would be married to the son of his prime minister. That's someone who's involved in his government, very high up. And the princess said, no, I won't marry the minister's son. And the king said, why won't you? She said, because I'm in love with the gardener's son. Oh, the king's very upset. He may have liked how the gardener tended to his garden, but he certainly didn't have a son who was good enough to be married to his daughter, the princess. But the princess was stubborn and determined, and the king wasn't sure what to do. So he consulted his officials, and they gave him a plan. They said, what you need to do is send both young men on a faraway journey to a far off land. And the first one who manages to come back wealthy and ready to be wed is the one to whom you shall give your daughter. And the king thought this was a good enough plan. So he said it to the two young men, but to the prime minister's son, he gave a strong, fast horse and he gave plenty of money to help him along his way. The gardener's son was given an old nag of a horse and no money at all. But before they left, the princess pulled the gardener's son to the side and said, you must hurry back. I love you and I want to marry you. Take this with you. And she gave him a bag full of jewels to help him on his way. Well, the two of them set out. And of course, the prime minister's son on his fast horse was soon far, far ahead of the gardener's son. He stopped at a crossroads where there happened to be a well where people would stop to drink. And sitting beside the well was an old woman in a ragged dress. And the old woman said, please have pity on me. Help me along my way. I can't walk any further. The prime minister's son pulled his, his robes aside so she wouldn't get them dirty and said, why should I help an old beggar woman? Be gone. And after he finished drinking his own water and watering his horse, he left her behind. Some time later, the gardener's son came by. And the old woman was still there and she called out to him please please young man help an old woman along her way i have no more strength in my legs to keep walking he said of course you don't you must have come so far here climb up on my horse behind me and we'll carry you where you need to go and so she did and after a time and after a long amount of travel they made their way to the next town where the prime minister's son had already bought rooms for himself to stay at the finest inn in town. The gardener's son and the old woman made their way to the local tavern, but the beggar's inn, the cheapest place they could stay. And the gardener's son paid for the old woman to have a room to stay that night. Well, the next morning when they woke, the old woman said to the gardener's son, 
Before you leave, I want to thank you for your generosity and kindness. Here, I want you to take this bronze ring. When you speak to it, it will give you whatever your heart desires. Use it wisely. The gardener's son thanked her very, very much. And after they said goodbye, the gardener's son took the ring, looked at it, and said, Bronze ring, give me a ship, the finest ship. I want the hull to be made of gold and the mast of silver and the sails to be made of brocaded silk. And the holds, the storage areas, at the bottom of the ship should be filled with cargo of the finest wealth. And just like that, there was a ship in the harbor, just as he said. And so he climbed on board and sailed off till they reached the kingdom that they were meant to reach. Being in this fast ship, he got there well ahead of the prime minister's son, long enough to set himself up in an inn where he could establish his fortune. And he finally came across the prime minister's son one day in the streets. And at this point, the minister's son was dressed almost in rags because he'd spent all of his money just getting there. He wasn't used to being uh, frugal and watching his pennies. And he'd been forced to take a job sweeping garbage out of the streets. And the gardener's son looked at the prime minister's son and pretended that he didn't recognize him. He said, what are you doing there? How are you doing? And the prime minister's son sighed. He didn't recognize the gardener's son, dressed finely as he was. He said, this was not where my life was supposed to go. You wouldn't know it to look at me, but I'm the son of a very, very important man. And I've fallen on hard times, and all I want to do is get back home. The gardener's son said, I have mercy on you. I will give you my generosity and help send you on your way, but you have to promise to do whatever I say. Prime Minister's son said, of course. And so he followed the gardener's son back to where his lodgings were. And when they were there, the gardener's son had the prime minister's son pull up his sleeve and he took the bronze ring and he used it to make a permanent mark on the prime minister's son's arm, one that couldn't be removed. And he said, now I will give you a ship. And he took the bronze ring to another room where he couldn't be heard. And he said, bronze ring, I want you to create for me a ship that is black as midnight from top to bottom and I want the sails to be made of rags. And just like that, it was done. And he gave the ship to the prime minister's son, who at this point was willing to take anything. And he climbed onto the ship and sailed as fast as he could back to his home kingdom. After a time, the gardener's son followed. But of course, the prime minister's son got there first. And although the king was shocked to see him dressed in rags and climbing off of an old ship with ragged sails, he had gotten there first, and so he, there was nothing for it but to promise his daughter to the Prime Minister's son. And she was so upset, but there was nothing she could do. And the days approached for the wedding. And the day of the wedding came, a ship pulled into the harbor. It was made of gold with a silver mast and silvercated sails. And the king said, who is this dressed like a prince sailing into my kingdom? And he went and greeted him. And he said, traveler from far away, we welcome you. Would you like to attend the wedding? My daughter is being married today. The gardener's son, not being recognized, said, of course I would like to attend. He went to the castle and he saw the princess and the man she was to marry. And he gasped and said, what is this? How can you marry your daughter to a man like that? And the king said, well, this is the son of my prime minister. The gardener's son said, whatever he may have been, this is my former servant. This man I took off the streets where he was sweeping garbage. And the prime minister's son said, that's a lie. That's not true. The gardener's son said, I will tell you the truth of it. When I last saw him, he was sailing away in a ship that was pure black with sails that were falling apart. And the king said, that's true. And the prime minister's son protested and argued. And the gardener's son said, let me prove what I say. 
pull up his sleeve and look at his arm and see if it doesn't have the mark of my ring on it. And at that point, the prime minister's son could not say a word in his defense. And at that point, the gardener's son said, now, do you recognize me? And the princess said, I know who you are. You are the man that I fell in love with and that I will love for the rest of my life. And the king looked at him and he could see nothing wrong with him. And so he married his daughter to the gardener's son and they lived happily ever after in a land full of lovely gardens. Can you guys show me your very best lion? <gasps> That's really, really scary. You guys are scary lions. We're gonna do a rhyme called Leo the Lion. It goes like this. Leo the Lion, show me your mane, is king of the jungle. His jaws are big and wide. When Leo the Lion roars, let me hear you roar, roar! It's a warning. You'd better run away and hide. So run, run, run as fast as you can from the lion with the proud mane of hair. Cause Leo's the fierce leader of his clan. Look into his eyes if you dare. Let's try that one more time. Leo the lion is king of the jungle. His jaws are big and wide. When Leo the lion roars, roar! It's a warning. You'd better run away and hide. So run, run, run as fast as you can from the lion with the proud mane of hair. Cause Leo's the fierce leader of his clan. Look into his eyes if you dare. Tell me something. Do you like poems? Do you know any poems? Maybe you know some nursery rhymes, like Jack be nimble, Jack be quick, Jack jumped over the candlestick. Or how about little boy blue, come blow your horn, the sheep's in the meadow, the cow's in the corn. Or maybe something from the new kid on the block or something by Shel Silverstein. Anyway, this story I'm gonna tell you is a poem and it's a really, really old poem. It was written in a year that didn't start with a 20, like the years do right now. It didn't even start with a 19. It started with an 18. It was written in 1876 by a man named Edward Lear. And it's kind of a silly poem. It's got some words in it that you don't know what they mean. I don't know what they mean because they don't mean anything at all. They're kind of made up words. But the thing about made up words in a poem like this is that you can make them mean whatever you want them to mean. You could have a picture in your head that'll not be like the picture in anyone else's head, but that's okay because it's your picture. The name of this story is The Quangle Wangle's Hat. Now, what's a quangle wangle? I don't know. So what I want you to do, you can listen to this, but maybe go back and listen to it again. And I want you to close your eyes and picture what you think a quangle wangle might look like. You could even draw a picture of it. And if you do, can you do me a favor? Can you send it to me? I would love to see what you think it looks like. So let me read you the story, The Quangle Wangle's Hat. On the top of the crumpety tree, the quangle wangle sat, but his face you could not see on account of his beaver hat for his hat was a hundred and two feet wide with ribbons and bibbons on every side and bells and buttons and loops and lace so that nobody ever could see the face of the quangle wangle quee. The quangle wangle said to himself on the crumpety tree, jam and jelly and bread are the best of food for me. But the longer I live on this crumpety tree, the plainer than ever it seems to me that very few people come this way and that life on the whole is far from gay, said the quangle wangle quee. But there came to the crumpety tree, Mr. and Mrs. Canary. And they said, did ever you see a spot so charmingly airy? May we build a nest on your lovely hat? Mr. Quangle Wangle, grant us that. 
Oh, please let us come and build a nest of whatever material suits you the best, Mr. Quangle Wangle Quee. And besides, to the crumpety tree came the stork and the duck and the owl, the snail and the bumblebee, the frog and the thimble fowl, the thimble fowl with a corkscrew leg. And all of them said, we humbly beg we may build our homes on your lovely hat. Mr. Quangle Wangle, grant us that, Mr. Quangle Wangle Quee. And the golden grouse came there, and the pobble who has no toes, and the small Olympian bear, and the dong with the luminous nose, and the blue baboon who played the flute, and the orient calf from the land of Toot, and the addery squash, and the bisky bat, all came and built on the lovely hat of the Quangle Wangle Quee. And the Quangle Wangle said to himself on the crumpety tree, when all these creatures move, what a wonderful noise there'll be. And at night, by the light of the mulberry moon, they danced to the flute of the blue baboon on the broad green leaves of the crumpety tree. And all were as happy as happy could be with the Quangle Wangle Quee. All right, we had a silly poem about make-believe animals. So now we're gonna have a silly song about real animals who are being really, really silly. <laughs> and what I need your help for is this. I'm gonna be naming a lot of different kinds of animals, some of them really fast in a row. But since I'm gonna be singing and playing, I can't make the animal noises along with the song. But I bet you can. So like when I say elephant, what sound does an elephant make? Can you be an elephant? Woo! Or when I say monk or monkey, that's right. <laughs> I'm going to need your help, so get ready. All right, this is called the Animal Fair. <clears throat> I went to the animal fair, the birds and the beasts were there. The big baboon by the light of the moon was combing his auburn hair. You ought to have seen the monk. He climbed up the elephant's trunk. The elephant sneezed Achoo! and fell on his knees. And what became of the monk, the monk? And what became of the monk? Very good. <laughs> the kangaroo was dressed in an elegant velvet vest. The horse and the pig were dancing a jig to the tune that they loved best. The seal began to croon while juggling pick balloons. The kangaroo had nothing to do but rattle some silver spoons, some spoons, but rattle some silver spoons. <laughs> I went to the animal show where all of the animals go. The tall giraffe was making me laugh, a yelling, look out below. The monkey yanked out a chunk of hair from the elephant's trunk. The elephant snored, fell down on the floor, and almost fell on the monk, the monk, and almost fell on the monk. <laughs> the lion made a bow and tried to dance with a cow. The cow refused with several moves, which made the lion howl. The parrots in the trees were watching the chimpanzees. The chips were shy and covered their eyes and swung on the high trapeze, trapeze, and swung on the high trapeze. Let's do the first one again. I want to hear lots of birds and beasts, okay? <laughs> I went to the animal fair. The birds and the beasts were there. The big baboon by the light of the moon was combing his auburn hair. You ought to have seen the monk. He climbed on the elephant's trunk. The elephant sneezed. Huh? Ah. Uh, achoo! <gasps> and fell on his knees. And what became of the monk, the monk? And what became of the monk? <laughs> Good job, guys. Did you like our stories and everything today? I'm really enjoying being able to tell you guys all of these stories. Some of them I heard when I was a little girl and I haven't really heard since. And some of them are brand new to me too. I like looking around the world and seeing what kind of stories that mommies and daddies and grandmas and grandpas and aunts and uncles and friends like to tell the little boys and girls who grow up and tell other little boys and girls. It's a lot of fun to hear stories like that that get passed down on and on and on. Anyway, I hope you guys are having a good summer and not getting too hot and not getting sunburnt. Make sure you wear your sunscreen. <laughs> and I can't wait until we can see each other again in person. Until then, though, I will see you next week for some more story times. 
In the meantime, here we go. Let me see you get a big stretch. Ooh, oh, that feels good. Reach for the ceiling and touch the floor. Stand up again, let's do some more. Touch your head and now your knees up to your shoulders. <clears throat> like this, you see, got a big shrug, that feels good. Reach for the ceiling and touch the floor. And that's all there is. There isn't any more. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.